Hey everybody, this is Russ from Retro Game Core. Today we're going to review the Game Boy Macro, excuse me, the Ambernic RG300X. Now this device is obviously modeled after the Game Boy Micro, but doesn't really have that micro size that you may be expecting. Essentially, this is a newer spin on an older line of devices, the RG350 series as well as the RG280 series. And this little handheld is an interesting mixture of tried and true performance and operating system, as well as some newer design features. There's quite a few things I like about this device, but there are some seriously heavy caveats here too. So let's take a few minutes and do a deep dive review of the Ambernic RG300X. So before we get started, let's get into some of the tech specs. This thing runs a JZ4770 MIPS CPU with a clock speed of about 1 GHz and 512 MB of RAM. It has a 3-inch OCA laminated display with a 4x3 aspect ratio and a hefty 640x480 screen resolution. It also has a 2500 mAh battery, which is going to give you about 6 hours of gameplay. It also has an HDMI out function, as well as rumble. Now all told, these are all the systems that are going to run on this device. In a nutshell, it'll run everything in the 16 and 8-bit era just fine, and it'll run most PlayStation 1 games pretty well too. Now the firmware that this runs is called OpenDingux, and it's been around for a long time, so there's a lot of different emulators available. For example, you can play Pico 8 games, Scum VM, DOSBox, and things like that. Just bear in mind that it's not a super powerful system, so you may experience some slowdown with certain systems like Super Nintendo and some arcade games as well. But at the end of the day, I'd say it's a reliable device for playing 8-bit and 16-bit games. So before we get into too many of the details of the device itself, let's do a quick unboxing. To be honest, the designs of these boxes for these Amber Dink devices keep getting a little bit better. I like the white and red coloring here. So inside the box, in addition to the device, you're going to get a USB-C charging cable, as well as a manual that you're probably never going to read. And moment of truth, it looks like Ambernick sent me the classic colors from the Famicom, which is dark red and golden. And the coloring's okay, you know, it's kind of tired at this point. I've seen so many devices modeled after this coloring. I will say these chrome shoulder buttons really stand out. I don't know if I like that or not. On the bottom, you can see dual SD card slots, as well as a reset button and a headphone jack. I like that the headphone jack is at the bottom. On the side, you have a power button. And up top, you have four very shiny shoulder buttons. Two USB ports, one for charging, one for peripherals, as well as a mini HDMI out port. We'll test that here later. And finally, on the left side here, we have a volume rocker. Now, one of the standout features of this device is that the whole front is just one single piece of plastic. It has a very nice quality to it. It reminds me of a first party device rather than some cheap Chinese knockoff. The face buttons on this device are unique for an Ambernic device because they don't actually have the letters etched into the buttons themselves. They're smooth, much like on a Pow Kitty device, and I really like that. Overall, these are very classic buttons, what you would expect from an Ambernic device. They have a nice, mushy, retro feel to them without going too flush into the case. I consider this to be just about perfect when it comes to retro buttons. Now, the D-pad is almost identical to any other Ambernic device. Definitely feels like an old-school NES game pad, and I like that. The D-pad is also very tight and responsive, and it does feel like the D-pad is sticking out a little bit more from the case than with my other devices. And that might be because it's brand new, but all the same, it does feel like it's sticking out quite a bit. I don't think it's a bad thing. And this is the first Ambernic device that has dual front-facing stereo speakers. And I'm a big fan of this feature, so I appreciate that. Overall, this Game Boy Micro design, you know, having the start and select buttons here on the bottom and kind of having this roundedness to it is a little bit weird to get used to, but I'm telling you, this slick interface here on the front, as well as on the back, is really, really nice feeling. You can see it's a bit rounded on the back, which makes it comfortable to hold. And additionally, all the screws are along the side of the device, which makes the back feel even smoother. So in terms of size, the device that is actually closest to this is the Pow Kitty RGB10. Now, other Ambernic devices, like the RG351P, or even the RG350P, are a little bit bigger, but not much. In fact, this RG300X is much bigger than I was expecting it to be. I was thinking, because of the overall Game Boy Micro design, the 3-inch display, and the lack of an analog stick, I thought it would be a much smaller device. And so it's a bit confusing to me why they didn't go with a smaller device in the first place. Now, in terms of button sizes, I always complain that these devices have too small of buttons. And you can see they actually made the buttons on this device a little bit bigger. So instead of your typical 7.5 or just under 8 millimeters for each button size, this one's almost 8.5 millimeters. It's a subtle difference, but I do appreciate it. But the D-pads are the exact same size, no surprises there. In terms of weight, this is 154 grams, which is pretty lightweight. 
You can see the RG280V is 124 grams, but other than that, it's lighter than most other devices. 189 grams for the 351P, 200 grams for the metal RGB10, and 180 grams for the 350P. The handheld device that I own that's closest in weight to the RG300X is this Playgo, which is basically a BitBoy Pocket version 2, and it comes in at 161 grams. But this one's definitely the lightest of the handhelds I have that are at this size. And if you're also wondering, this device is the closest in color to my cat chicken. So if that's something that's important to you, well then, cool. Now when you first boot up the device, you're going to see that the select and start buttons are illuminated from the back end. And the bright blue that comes out of them is a little bit off-putting, but you get used to it pretty quickly. Now this runs on the OpenDingX operating system. And the way you navigate through this is you pick your emulator and then you pick the game within that, but it also has a dedicated games tab with a bunch of open source games. And that's really it in a nutshell. All of the RG350 and 280 devices run the same operating system. And in the settings, you can see that they updated the kernel, but I'm curious to see if the updated version of OpenDingux, known as the OpenDingux Beta, works on this device out of the box. So let's take out the SD cards and see what we're working with. So in the first slot, you have a 16 gigabyte card, which runs your operating system as well as your apps. And then in the second SD card, it looks like they packed in a 64 gigabyte card here filled with games. Depending on where you buy it from, you may not get a second SD card with your device. So I'm gonna take out the SD cards from my RG350M, which has the same screen resolution as this device, and I'm gonna see whether or not it works. One thing to note is the micro SD card slots in here have a little bit of an opening there, which makes it very easy to get the cards in and out. So booting up the system with the OpenDingX beta, you can see it's not working at all. So it's probably gonna to need to be recompiled for this device specifically. We'll have to wait until we get better firmware. For now, let's test out the games using the stock operating system. First up, let's try the Nintendo, and let's try a random unknown game. Let's try this one here called Super Mario Bros. 3. Now in booting it up, you can see the scaling is a little bit off, so let's go into the settings and see what we can adjust. Now under the video scaling here, you can see there's several different options. Let's try this full screen smooth one. As you can see, that's not really working well with this device and this emulator. So in looking at the different options that you have available, it looks like this full screen fast one is probably going to be your best bet. Now unfortunately, it doesn't scale perfectly. You can see here the text is a little bit off here. It's unbalanced. And this is one of the reasons why it'll be much better to use the OpenDingX Beta, because then we can run RetroArch on this device at a very good speed. But for now, until we can get the better firmware running, this is what we're going to have to work with. Now for example, if we want to change it to the original aspect ratio, you can see here it's just much smaller. And even though the pixels do look great, I don't think you're going to want to play it at that size. Regardless, the act of actually playing these games is a pretty nice experience. And at first I really didn't like this face button layout. I'm so used to that north, south, west, east configuration, but I quickly adapted to this button layout and I kind of like it. The buttons are spaced out a little bit more than I'd like, but again, it's something I got used to almost instantly. And I think you'll like it too. So trying out other emulators, here's the Game Boy Advanced emulator. And you can see this one has different image scaling options. And hardware scaling is the one I would recommend because that one typically will scale up and also not cause pixel issues. Now there are updated versions of a lot of these emulators and you can find them on my website in the RG350 section. But for now, I'm just testing out with all the stock emulators. Now, same thing with the Game Boy and Game Boy Color emulator. You can also change this one to hardware scaling, which is gonna give you the best scaling options. In general, Game Boy Advance, Game Boy, and Game Boy Color look really good on this device. So let's up the ante a little bit and check out Super Nintendo. Now going into these options, you can see that also has a hardware scaling option as well as smooth and fast. Let's try the fast one first. And as you can see, Mega Man's life bar is all messed up, which is a good indication that you're having scaling issues. So let's go in and change those settings to full screen smooth, which should essentially round out all these pixels. And it looks better, but it's still not perfect. It's still having issues when it comes to scaling. So let's go back into the settings and then change it to hardware scaling. And look at that, it looks great. Now, one thing you may notice is it's running at an eight by seven aspect ratio instead of four by three. And in OpenDingux, there's a hotkey you can press, which will change the aspect ratio. To do that, you hold down power and press the A button. There you go, much better. Now, I would say after about maybe 30 minutes of testing altogether, I was having a great time, and it struck me as to why I was enjoying this device so much. And it's because of the super sleek texture of this front faceplate. The fact that it's super smooth makes it a very enjoyable experience. And I love the fact that it's just one piece of plastic across the entire thing. It really is a beautiful device to hold in the hands. Some other features with this device is it does have built-in rumble. So if you have a game, for example, a PS1 game that has that rumble feature, 
which often you can turn on in the game settings. So here in Tekken 3, it's rumbling every time I land a punch. And in general, PS1 gameplay is pretty good. There are going to be games that have some lag, but for the most part, I would say 90% of PS1 games are going to play perfect. And along those same lines, arcade games play pretty well too. I would expect to play most of the games in the CPS1, CPS2 catalogs, Neo Geo, things like that. Going to be just fine. One thing to note when playing Final Burn Alpha, you may experience screen tearing in certain games. For example, in Final Fight, you can see it in the background as you're moving around. But that's a pretty easy fix, just as you're launching the game, make sure you change the hardware scaling to full screen. And just like that, you'll have no screen tearing. So given the fact that we're probably going to have to wait a bit for opening X beta firmware, let me show you what the stock experience is like with this device. First of all, the stock firmware does not have a proper sleep function, so you're going to have to turn it on and off every time you want to play with it. So that process alone is going to take something along the lines of 14 or 15 seconds just to boot up. And then once you're in the system, you're going to have to navigate to the emulator section, pick your emulator, and then scroll down to find your game. There's no favorites function in this operating system either. And then factor in an additional second to change the aspect ratio with a hotkey of power plus A. So you're looking at the very least about 25 seconds from turning on the device to actually starting up a game. Another thing I should mention is that a lot of games are going to try to turn on auto sharpening, which will give you a dull picture with a 640x480 display. To turn off the auto sharpening, you hold down power and press the down button a couple times. These two hotkeys, power down and power A, are going to come like second nature to you after you've been playing with this device for a couple days. It's just one of the quirks of this firmware. Okay, how about we test out some other things? First, let's have a look at the light bleeding. As you can see, playing in the dark, the start and select buttons are very prominently bright, but what you also will see is that there is light bleeding from the area surrounding the D-pad, as well as around the shoulder buttons. It's definitely noticeable when you're playing in the dark, but not a huge deal breaker to me. Now on the opposite end of the spectrum, this device plays pretty well in open daylight. It's really no brighter than any of the other devices along the same kind of price point. But one thing I found interesting is that my five-year-old found it so light that he was comfortable laying on his back and playing it like this. And I think that says a lot about how balanced and lightweight this device is. Okay, now let's test out the HDMI out functionality. You're going to want to have a cable that has mini HDMI on one side and regular HDMI on the other. So I'm going to plug this into my device and then to my computer's capture card. One nice thing is the screen actually turns off when in HDMI mode, saving you some battery life. Now when it comes down to it, outputting your video signal to a TV or a monitor, it's going to show at 640x480 resolution, it's not going to upscale at all. And unless your monitor or TV allows you to have a 4x3 aspect ratio signal, it's going to expand it to widescreen. So if you're one of those people that really prefer the original aspect ratio when you're playing on a TV, this is probably going to disappoint you because everything's going to look a little bit squished. For the most part, the games play exactly like you would expect when you're plugging them into the TV. But certain emulators, for example the Gambate emulator, played at half speed, so Game Boy and Game Boy Colors were all messed up, and I couldn't figure out how to fix this. But in general, the rest worked pretty well. Game Boy Advance worked just fine. Now in Sega Genesis, I got a little bit of a, like a warbly sound while I was playing, but I didn't feel like the gameplay was slowing down at all. And in general, Super Nintendo played just fine as well. Okay, let's start wrapping up how I feel about this device. Let's start with what I like, and then we'll talk about what I don't like. So here are the things I like about this device. It has a very premium build quality to it. The face buttons and the D-pad themselves are very tight and responsive. They're exactly what I would like in a handheld device. The device itself is lightweight and sleek. Even though it's a little bit bigger than I was expecting, it's definitely a pocketable device. I feel like this is something you could throw in your pocket and take out in town, no problem. I do appreciate that this device has front-facing stereo speakers. I do think the design of the speaker holes are a little bit ugly, but I understand that they're just following the design language of the Game Boy Micro itself. And for better or worse, the opening X firmware is very familiar. If you've ever owned an RG350 or a 280 device, you're going to be right at home with this one. It's not the best firmware in the world, but it's like a nice old t-shirt that you have. Even though it has holes and stuff in it, you still like to wear it. And I do appreciate that they kept the HDMI out on this device. The experience isn't perfect, but it's still pretty cool to have this feature. Okay, so now let's talk about what I don't like about the RG300X. 
Well, for starters, this thing really needs an updated operating system, and it's unfortunate that the OpenDing Expeta firmware doesn't work on this yet, but I'm hoping that the team will get it running here pretty soon. Once it's up and running, I plan on putting RetroArch on this, as well as Simple Menu as my front end, and I plan to do an entire guide on how to set all this up once OpenDing Expeta is available. Now, something that surprised me about this device is the three inch screen is not as impressive as I was expecting. Honestly, it's just a little bit too small. I honestly feel that a 3.5 inch screen would have been a little bit better, or if they were gonna make it three inch screen, they should have made it a smaller device. Which leads to my next one. This device is just too big for its own good. It's kind of like the Goldilocks scenario where she kept trying to use Papa Bear's things and everything was too big. You know, the lack of analog stick and the pocketability of this device altogether really makes it feel like this device should have been even more pocketable and smaller. And it's just kind of weird, even though it's a relatively small device, it still feels oversized. And it's a strange experience. And I'll admit it, the Famicom coloring that they've been using on a lot of devices is getting a little bit old. Now luckily there's a black and silver version of this device, and honestly it probably looks better than this one here. So maybe think about that one if you're shopping around for this device. And finally the last point, and probably the biggest negative of this device altogether, is that this thing is almost $90. And you can find devices like the original RG350 that have the exact same performance as this device for about $60. And I really can't justify that $28 difference between these two devices. This thing has fewer features. It has zero analog sticks and a smaller screen, but costs way more than I would expect it to. For $88, you can buy something like the RGB10, which runs a much faster chipset and even runs certain games on the Nintendo 64, PlayStation Portable, and Dreamcast. And none of those systems are at all possible on this device. And so I get it, Ambernick tends to ask a little bit more for their devices, but for me, $88 is pushing it a little bit too far. I honestly feel that if this was a $60 or $65 device, I'd be able to recommend it wholeheartedly. So yeah, this is my review of the RG300X. I love the sleek design of it, and you can tell that this company put a lot of time and energy into making this feel just right. But that being said, at $88, I think it's just a little bit too much. All right, everyone, that's it for this video. Let me know if you have any questions in the comments below, and be sure to like and subscribe if you found this helpful. And we will see you next time. Happy gaming.